And I believe that it's, it's befitting to speak about Christ's power. How many know we need Christ's power? Yeah. And I'm praying I can get through this message but through the power of the Holy Spirit. I know he can. I pray I can walk with him. But we're going to learn today and understand today what type of faith is required for, to experience the power of his resurrection. We know it. We know it in our minds. We've been preached that. In fact, if I sit down now or I just pass the mic, many of you can preach a message about Resurrection Sunday. I know you can. You've heard it. You know all of the cliches. He died and he rose and all of that. You know the cliches, but what I want to bring today in a different uh, text is for you to experience the power because what good is it for us just to know about the power? To hear about the power and never experience the power. I believe that is solely missing in our churches today. Amen. And so as we've I've asked the Holy Spirit to help me, I pray that today it will be meaningful and very impactful and full of hope for you. Uh, I laughed uh, uh, when, uh, when Chap just went to have a seat. Chap told me one Sunday after I ministered, he said, you know, I hope you don't mind me sharing that. He said, I didn't share that. I, was, I didn't expect him to say it, and, but it was a, such a great compliment. He said, you know what, Dr. Lee? I've met a lot of dope dealers in my day. He said, but you're definitely a hope dealer. <laughs> And I, that was a compliment. Because we want to give you hope today. Amen? So lately, we, our church family, and, and, and guests, just visitors, just bear with me with this. Lately, you know, we're a church family. We're, we're a close family. And, and, and so lately, various, uh, uh, of, there are various members, and including myself, some family members have just been going through some crises lately, you know, either with illness of loved ones or, you know, loved ones transitioning or just, just going through. You know, every once in a while, you know, church is real people. Church is not this building. The church is the ones who's sitting on the chairs right now. And so every once in a while, you know, you, you go through some things. You go through some things as a family. You go through personal crises. And so I want to talk today, with it being Resurrection Sunday, about crises, families in crisis. Yes. What does the word say about going through difficult times? Have anyone besides this church gone through any difficult times? Just two people? Come on, you can talk in this church. It's okay to talk, as long as you're respectful. You, have, 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 have you gone through anything? Come on, we, let's wake this up. So what does the word say about such difficult times? I think that's the missing ingredient, ingredients is that we go through the motion of just being religious and going and we checking our boxes as we go on Sundays and we walking in one way and going out the same way we walked in without in any trans, uh, you know, apparent change. And that's because we're missing the ingredient of a living faith of a living God, someone we can connect to, someone who understands who we are, what we are, who understands our tears, who understands our sighing and our moaning and our groaning. Personal crisis may be sickness, it may be a disease, it may be a sickness in the marriage or on your job you have problems or the business, whatever it is. But guess what? One thing for sure I do know this is that we all, if we keep living, will go through some crisis. You will go through a crisis of belief, of what you believe. God is always challenging, challenging our faith to get us to rise to a higher level. Amen? So today, my sermon will address a family's crisis, and my title is simply Family in Crisis. Family in Crisis. What do you do when you find your family in a crisis? I'll be coming from John chapter 11. Reading some references, and I'm going to give you seven, the purpose of, seven purposes for Lazarus' death. This is about Lazarus' death, and I'm reading, and I, they're going to come as close to my translation as they possibly can, but I'm reading from the modern translation, but listen to this. It says, uh, Roman, and, I'm sorry, John chapter 11, verse 1 through 5, I'll start there. It says, now a certain man was lying ill named Lazarus of Bethany. 
the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whom or whose brother Lazarus was ill, was the one who poured the perfume over the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent to him to say, Master, he whom you love or he whom you hold dear is ill. Jesus received the message. In other words, he heard them. The next verse says this. Jesus replied, this illness is not to end in death but is to promote the glory of God in order that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Wait a minute, they asked Jesus. They said, Jesus, the one you love, one translation said, is sick. In other words, that was their plea, their cry, come do something about our situation. This was a family that is named specifically Lazarus, Mary and Martha. And if you don't know which Mary, because there were many Marys in the Bible, this was the one who took that costly perfume of alabaster and poured it over Jesus and wiped her, his feet with her hair. They want you to know which family this is. If I would say the Stewart family or the Jones family, God is saying specifically, this is a family in crisis. And this is their plight. Their brother is sick and even sick unto death. But look, let's go on. It says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Notice, Holy Spirit took the time to name them. What it's saying, what it's saying to me, and it should be saying to you on this resurrection morning, is that God knows your name. Yes. Yes. He knows who you are. Yes. And he knows what's going on with you. Yes. It says again, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When, however, two important words, he heard that Lazarus was ill, he still remained two days in the same place then after that he said to his disciples but I want to just stop here and let us return to Judah but listen Judea listen they called for him because they had a family crisis just like we do well our family go through crisis and we call on the name of the Lord the scripture says before he, he even said anything, he, he told them the intent. He said, this illness is not to end in death, but is to promote the glory of God in order that the Son of God may be glorified. So you would think after he said that, right, it makes sense to get up and start walking and head toward Bethany. That's what we would think. I called on God. I prayed. I told him my family's in trouble. The next thing I should be doing is receiving some help. That's logical. But I want you to know that God doesn't think like man thinks. Nor does he act the way we think he should act. And that's so many times that we put our faith in what we think God should be, what should God should do, how God should act. And when he doesn't come family, we get disappointed. The Bible said he remained still two more days. Why would he wait when this family had an urgent need? Their brother was near death, but Jesus waited. What was he waiting for? Why was he waiting? You gotta know sometimes when God doesn't answer our prayers immediately, he's waiting on something. Just because we're crying out, it doesn't mean he doesn't hear. It says, he received, it says, Jesus received the message. Just like he receives your message through prayer. He always receives our message. So I guess your question for me this morning would be, well, why doesn't he always answer? Well, I would say this. He does answer. We just don't always like the way he responds. 
because we don't understand. But let's look at the narrative. Let's look at this story. It doesn't, it, it, it doesn't make sense. When he heard, he remained. So here's this family that Jesus loved that's in the crisis. He sends them the word and he said, this illness is not to end in death, but it's to promote the glory of God in order that the Son of God may be glorified. I know they heard too. Don't you think they heard too? They heard that message? Just like he heard their message? He'd already given them the answer, but watch this now. I believe that as Christians, as we go through things in life and we don't understand why God responds the way he does or the way he allows certain things, I believe it causes us to lose faith. I'm, I'm talking real now. It causes us to lose faith because we've called on him and we're going through a crisis. Why isn't he responding to our need? He heard about it. So there are times that when we're in a crisis that God is allowing a test to come. Yes, yes. You will not understand your faith in God if you're not, if your faith is not put to a test. Yes. It's not that God is ignoring our plea or ignoring our pride. It's, he wants to see, do you truly have faith in him or are you just seeking him for what he can deliver to you? He's for a people, church family, who wants him for him. So there are times of testing of our faith. There are times of testing our patience. Will we wait on God or will we take matters into our own hands? Have you noticed that you have prayed sometimes and then he takes too long? Let me ask, let me, let me turn it around. Have you ever prayed and he took too long and you took matters into your own hands? Did it turn out okay? No. Our faith has to be tested. Our patience has to be tried. And then our trust in who Jesus Christ is has to be determined. Amen. One will never know how much they truly believe in Christ until there is a crisis of belief. What, what he's testing is the crisis of your belief. You, each of us believe. But we all believe at different, on different levels. We all don't believe the same. I promise you, if we can ask one question, we'll get a hundred different answers. Why? Because of the belief system. And the one who knows truly our belief system is God. Amen? And so a test about what I truly believe, what you truly believe, what you truly believe about him. Because we say often, and I was in the store the other day, and I, I saw a little cliche that they even, you know, putting it on t-shirts. Now, God is good all the time. God is good. And that sounds good. And it is true. But how many times have we experienced the goodness of God? Yeah. For church family, I came this morning to tell you sometimes the goodness of God may be delayed. Yeah. Just so you can, he can see exactly where you are. If what I say to others is truly what I believe in my heart. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Hmm. Truly. What I say to others, is that truly how you believe? Christ has come to expose exactly what we believe what we claim yes. and what we do. Yes. What does it mean to truly have Christ as your Lord and Savior? What does it mean to you today as we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ? Think about it for a moment. What do you believe? What truly do you believe? When we take Holy Communion, what does that mean to you? Amen? On a daily basis, on a daily basis, we have an opportunity to trust God. We have a, an opportunity every day to show that we believe in God. And I want you to know that our belief and the ability to believe that God can do the impossible is often shaken through times of crisis. So God will wait a minute and step back a little bit just to reveal, not to make you uncomfortable, not, not to 
be, make a, a, a burden become something, something that you can't handle, but it's just to cause you and I to locate ourselves. And that's not a bad thing, saints, because if I don't know what I believe, then I will believe anything when someone comes my way. I don't know. See, God is saying, I want you to experience me for yourself. The woman that at the well in John chapter 4, she, God encountered her and God talked to her about her own individual life. And he impacted her life in such a wonderful way that she ran off, left her water pot and said, I'm going to town and I'm going to say, come see a man that has told me everything about myself. They followed her base. Listen to what I'm saying, church family. They followed her based on her reputation and based on her testimony. But what Jesus did, he took it a step further. After she gathered them to meet Jesus, he then did the same thing for them. How do you know, Pastor? Well, because of their testimony. They told her, not now we believe for ourselves. And that's where we have to come to the fact that do you believe for yourself? Not because somebody else's faith or somebody else is telling you to believe in God, but God has given us an invitation this morning for us to believe for ourselves. So crisis, family, is a to reveal where our trust lies, a whom it lies in. It is a great revealer. Can we still believe in the midst of a crisis? There's seven purposes for Lazarus' death, and I'll, I'll go a little bit further to explain all of them to you, each of them. Purpose number one is to glorify God. He told them his intent. Yeah. To glorify God and to proclaim that Jesus is the Son of God. That's what he was trying to do. What is he trying to do when our families are in a crisis? What he's trying to do when we're going through hard times? To prove to us, to show us he wants to give God the glory, but he also wants to proclaim that he is the Son of God. He wants you to know him for, for yourselves. Can everybody say that? He, he wants me to know him for personal God. Though he called all of them by name, showing that he was a personal God. Purpose number two is to show that Jesus' greatness of his love, how great he loved. But John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world that he what? Gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him shall not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. All you have to do is believe. He said, well, how do I believe? It's to have faith and trust in what Jesus Christ came to deliver. It's to have faith in the Father to know that he sent his son for you. That's all it takes. It is not rocket scientists. It's not anything hard. You can believe. In fact, 